This is the Roaring Elephant Podcast. Here I am with my co-host, my corporately, culturally impactful co-host, Jon. Impactful, that's... Uh, I mean, consider the title of this of these episodes. I'm not sure if this is a compliment or not. I mean... I, I did just think that usually impaction is some sort of medical condition. <laughs> Maybe we should move on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you, you lost me. I, I'm putting the brain, the, the language barrier here. Let, let's talk about corporate culture impact. Indeed. Part three. Let's do that. For people who haven't followed this uh, series, perhaps we have done two episodes on this. It all started when Basecamp kind of went um, something. <laughs> and we yeah. expanded on the subject. And this is the third and probably, possibly final uh, episode on this um, topic, I guess. We'll see how far we get because... As usual, we have more on the on the, on the things we want to talk about and the times that the time permits. Indeed, indeed. <clears throat> so, as as you mentioned, this this session was really, I suppose, inspired by some of the uh, goings on at uh, at Basecamp. And just as we wrap this up, I want to talk a little bit about how um, how perhaps the way that this was all communicated in the first place actually had such an impact on the end result and you know maybe the fallout that that came from it and in we've we've talked a lot about different sort of um, different pieces of the the story but one of the sort of core pieces i think here is the way this all this information was released is essentially the two founders had this discussion behind closed doors as far as i can gather and pretty much released this knowledge as a public blog post before even communicating it or maybe it was simultaneously communicated to uh, employees like there was no consultation period there was no hey we're thinking about doing this you know let us know it was just uh you know two dudes in the back office having a chat well two dudes probably on a zoom having a chat i guess um and uh deciding okay this is the change that we're going to make to our company that will affect all the people that work here and of course they're absolutely within their right to do so they're it's their company. They can run it any way they want, and they sure did. <laughs> um, but I mean, Jon, how how much do you think the way that this was communicated, with the total lack of feedback, it sort of influenced the what ended up happening here? Um, I think majorly. I mean, they. Uh... I want to go back one step and on the why they did it this way because we don't know we were there we're not these two guys so we can't say so i can only imagine things but what i'm thinking about there is that uh, basecamp did have a good reputation when it came to good culture good openness they actually were a little bit i mean you mentioned this in the first episode about this a little bit of a poster child for the good way of doing things and it feels to me that the leadership in a com in this company had a wrong idea of how the culture was at that moment and were in the apparently illusion that they had a good feel of the pulse of the company and were able to do this without consultation or at least suggesting it internally first and seeing what the feedback is and just go public with that. Is that arrogance, misguidedness, I don't know, something there. And But it definitely had an impact because that led basically to some employees going public with their grievances if this had been done internally as a we're thinking of doing this what do you think that would have been a much easier way to handle it and because it went public at the first step all the reactions became public the reaction on the reaction became public and that's when <laughs> i mean look at social media things discussion discussions to? in public well from time to time Discussions in public have a tendency of becoming a bit of a flame war and escalating much more quickly than when it's being done in the circle of people that know the background, know the ins and outs, know the context around it. And people get riled up. Yeah. 
Yeah, I I agree. I, I it's probably a bit of a stretch to try and imagine how the conversation might have gone differently if there had been some internal conversation. There are just there are too many variables. You know, the the major ones I'm guessing being you know would would the fact if the if you know everyone had responded perhaps negatively or given not negatively necessarily, but given strong feedback on the proposals, would they have continued to go ahead? I mean, who knows? But it it definitely seems to be clear to me as well that the the way that this was done, the way this was communicated, the the lack of transparency to the individuals that were going to be very much affected by this you know, ahead of the announcement, just uh, yeah, seemed to be at the core of why this became such an explosive kind yeah. of challenge for them. I mean, I can imagine that people kind of felt betrayed. I mean, we're going to be talking about this in, uh, the, 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 later in this episode furthermore, but empowering your, your workforce is very good, very important. Empowering them, yeah. making them feel empowered, making them feel connected, feel like they have maybe not a decision, but a, a say in the decision. So even if yeah. you just inform them first, let them get feedback and still do it. Cool, they'll still be unhappy, but they'll f people will feel engaged in the decision making. And even though I mean, I can I cannot always have my way. I mean, I like coffee. I hate tea. I do no longer want to have tea in the office. Not going to happen. Other people like tea, but at least I had a say in it. <laughs> at least I can get my coffee, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. So there is a, just having the people. Maybe the illusion. I mean, illusion is there, but it does work. Having them given them the illusion of having a say in the decision might already have been enough to get the, the sharp edges of the whole thing. Just yeah. But in this case, I mean, if you just read it on the internet first, that would be the I, as, as you say. I hope they at least the simultaneously in the company as well. But if you had to read this on the internet first, it's a slap in the face at that point. And again, escalation. That's how escalations happen. Yeah, indeed. Okay, so. As we as we wrap up the the sort of the the first little piece of this kind of sort of primarily talking about how how Basecamp sort of start handled this particular situation, um, Jan actually did uh, some pretty spectacular research okay. and found a bunch of articles around similar related sort of situations, whether it's workplace culture, you know, both good and bad and, and you know, some of the things that uh, you know, you can you can look out for or some of the things you can maybe avoid. And I suppose there's there's a few things we'll probably um, call out. There's a the first article is around um, you know toxic workplace culture um, having a, an impact on both the employees but also the customers as well and what to, what to look for. And the, the three, there are three main um, pieces that this article calls out. One is leading by example. Another one is communication, and the third one is agility. And and these, these all just make perfect sense to to me at least. So leading by, leading by example. You know, I at the moment happen to be a, a manager. Um, I run a number of teams and it, I think it's incredibly important as a leader to to be leading by example to be leading by example not just in uh, how you perform a particular task but in how you behave in how you interact with others in how you you know perform any part of your role uh, and when this is talking about leading by example, I would say that's not just something that is that applies to people that are managers. Like anyone can be a, a leader in the right kind of organization. You can be an individual contributor and you can still lead. You can still influence. You can mentor new starters. You can provide guidance and feedback to, to people that are maybe more junior or in different parts of the organization. You can provide feedback to your peers and you know people across the organization so 
I I can't imagine a situation where <laughs> that's the example that you're making is bad, that that kind of leading by example can be seen to be sort of a negative thing. Um, yeah, speaking as a person who is literally underneath you at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I have to wait for those a long of time you not on YouTube, hop on YouTube quickly and you're and missing see, out and see me see me sort of pointing <laughs> down at Yon. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean it's the whole do as I do as I say, not as I do. That doesn't work. I mean, if you just say all the good things but do different things in your daily activities, it's an you, you lose your trustworthiness. You, you lose your your place at the leadership role at that point. Because if I can't trust you to be what you say you are, then why should I be any different? Why should I make a difference if I can see that you're a manager and you get along just fine doing whatever you do? Why shouldn't I? And yeah, that's management part. The second part of leading, of course, that's I mean, typically you have the leadership in management roles, and then you have things like tec technical leadership where you can become a expert on a certain technical uh, aspect but in both cases you become a person other people look up to <laughs> for good or bad reasons <laughs> i need to change this layout um <laughs> but the moment you're in that kind of uh, spotlight role you, you kind of have to be careful on how you work with that and one of the reasons that I'm not a manager, to be honest, is I, I don't want that spotlight. I want to be an asshole from time to time. Being an asshole is fun from time to time <laughs> within certain <laughs> limitations, obviously. <clears throat> but that's just, yeah, how people work. And I mean, yeah, leading by example, if that's missing, there's no way you're ever going to have a good culture. The end, yeah. period. Yeah. Okay, so the next one, communication. Uh, I think we can we can look back at the uh, the the situation with Basecamp, and we can definitely point out that uh, yeah, communication was not strong there, and the the words that this uh, this calls out are frequent, transparent, and authentic communication, and it, it's across the board. It's not yeah. just <clears throat> in one direction. It's it's not just in two directions. It's it's all over the uh, the organization. Um, the the word that I really like in this, and I've already used it a couple of times in this uh, this episode so far. I'm sure I've used it in the previous um, culture ones. Is transparency or being transparent? I think that being transparent in the way that you communicate is so incredibly important it the, it, does, it does nobody any good if you're obfuscating or um you know trying to hide a message or you know trying to come at things from a, an awkward angle and hope that someone picks up the sort of subtleties of whatever it is you're trying to tell them um now that doesn't mean that uh you can be you know blunt and overly ignorant of other people's feelings or anything like that that's that's not what this means uh, but being open about you know your your thoughts your concerns your ideas is incredibly important and without this kind of behavior again i i it seems to me to be a you know a fundamental sort of cornerstone of of good culture yeah, and one thing I want to add first is transparency doesn't mean you have to say everything and be totally open about your financials or whatever. It just means that if you if you decide not to be open about something, be transparent about the fact that you don't want to be open about it. Don't beat around yeah. the bush. Just be honest and transparency are very close together at this point, I think. Yeah. It's a distinction because a lot of time things people say, we can't be transparent. We need uh, We need some things we can't talk about. That's fine. Just be transparent about the things you can't talk about. Easy enough. Yeah, yeah, you know, <clears throat> really good examples of that are things, things that are of a legal nature. In some cases, you know, that there are legal reasons why you can't talk about certain things. You know, yeah. employee sort of conditions or situations you know, that that an individual is in, 
it's not really it's not the sort of thing that you can just broadcast about to the company it's not the way that it works but um at, you know things like financials is an interesting kind of one because um i've worked in organizations where the the financial situation of the company was so shrouded in mystery actually is probably the phrase i would use so difficult to actually understand what on earth was going on that there was a continual sort of underlying sense of you know is this organization going to be here a year or five years or 10 years from now like am i am i just investing my time and my personal brand in something that's just gonna go up in smoke next year yeah. and I've also worked in organizations where literally, you know, regularly on the, the C, on the, on an all hands call, the CEO will bring up a, you know, a picture of a bank statement showing exactly how much money there is in the bank. <laughs> and, and then the graphs following on about how we're going to be spending it and how, you know, how revenue is coming in and things like that. And uh, I certainly know which one of those two situations I prefer, you know, transparency all the way. So depends um, on the amount of but, money on the bank statement there. <laughs> that was well, negative that, two million. But at, least, <laughs> at least you know then. Yeah. At least you know. Then yeah. you can make a decision. But if if no one ever talks about it, then how do you ever know? It's it's yeah. Yeah, I think transparency and the way that different organizations approach transparency of the same information. Uh, is is very very interesting, and I like the fact you said personal brand there because transparency is definitely not only towards your customers but also towards the employees because your personal brand is getting more and more important these days. Having some kind of public face and people seeing you from the LinkedIn to the Twitter to the Facebooks, whatever, having that presence, and this is something that also gets affected, of course. Uh, I also thought yeah. of two other examples that uh, transparency might not mean total openness and that's uh, salaries of employees. I mean, some companies mm -hmm. put all their stuff on Glassdoor. I think the, uh, the site is called. Some companies don't. Either is fine. Just don't lie about it. Uh, roadmap information. I mean, Google, I think, is a bit defective here. Defective, deficient here. Announcing new projects too soon, making people hyped up and then killing them because, well, in the end, it didn't work out. You have to be careful with that. And again, depending on the culture, depending on the image the company has, you can be more or less open about it. But regardless, be transparent about it. The last thing I want to say about communication is it's also a very good tool for uh, hiring. Because a yeah. good, transparent company with good communication internally and externally will allow you to attract better people. Because when I go on the job market, which happens rarely, but does happen from time to time, I look around. When I see a company I think I'm interested in, I will look on, on LinkedIn, on news articles, on, on stock, ex stock exchange information, whatever, to see not only what they're talking about, but how they're talking about this stuff. And the more convoluted, the more shrouded in mystery it is, the mm. less eager I'll be to actually engage with that company in the first place. So that's also yeah. something that very tied into corporate culture communication. I was I was actually just gonna say when you Correct. when you mentioned <laughs> that that I think culture, at least certainly to me, is one of the most important things I look for. I, I also change jobs relatively infrequently, but as like you, it obviously does happen. And the culture is one of the things that, you know, really, really does matter to me. Where, you know, everyone, every one of us spends a uh, fairly sizable chunk of time uh, working with, with people uh, that hopefully we enjoy working with and working for. And a lot of that is working under yeah working under <laughs> a lot of that is um is driven by the the culture you know cultures good cultures tend to attract more people that enjoy working in and with that kind of culture um so yeah no i i, I agree flipping it around if i look back at my uh, my history when do i leave a company when the culture no longer satisfies my needs. 
I mean, there's one yeah. exception. My I used to work for Silicon Graphics, and they kind of went bust, so I kind of had to find another job at that point. But if they didn't had if they had gone bust, I would still be working there because the culture was brilliant. And yeah. all the all the other employers I left were because at certain points in time, I'm not saying the culture was bad, but mm. the culture did no longer fit my idea of what the ideal culture should be. To a point that I decided to look around and found a better match. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I completely agree. Completely agree. All right. Um, the third one here is sort of agility. It's more the results, I, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, bending, stretching, all very, very important. A uh, bit of yoga. But this <laughs> not, is... Not yoga. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of those things that... Um, I I don't know that, to me at least, I don't know that an organization that's not agile is necessarily toxic. Like an organization that is more mm -hmm. stagnant, like there's, 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 different there's reasons nothing, for it. yeah, like there's nothing inherently wrong. Like I think, you know, poor communication and people not leading by example, again, assuming the examples are good, um, I think those, those are to me are, are very clear, um, signs of, of sort of, poor culture but i i think agility is a bit more is a bit more nuanced yeah i think it's not reversible i mean not being an agile company doesn't necessarily mean you have a bad call, uh, corporate culture although it is a yeah. problem for the company because if you're very stagnant at certain points you will become obsolete yeah but i yeah. do think the reverse is true that a bad a toxic company culture will lead to a stagnant environment because and that's something that comes up in the next uh, article because people are afraid to take risks because because of the culture, nobody wants to say no to the boss because if you say no to the boss, you get fired. And that will automatically lead to less innovation, less creativity wow. because people simply don't care anymore. See, I, I, I don't think that's necessarily true. And okay. the reason why I would say that is because I have also been in organizations where uh, the, let's say, leader of said organization had what I would call shiny object syndrome. Hmm. And they would just Squirrel. redirect, exactly, <laughs> redirect the entire company or large chunks of the company on a whim, you know, throw out everything you're doing on that, go and do this, or carry on doing everything you're doing on that and now do this as well. No more time, just get it done. Uh, and, and would make these kind of shifts mm -hmm on a whim and again like to me i i know that's not technically agility <laughs> um but that was that was a, a situation where the organization was would would change almost too rapidly too regular well like regularly but too uh yeah too rapidly too often for reasons that weren't were maybe not communicated and were were done in a way that was was you know was more toxic but the thing that i to sort of move on to a slightly happier note the thing that i do agree with on on the agility side of things is the there being uh, i often use the phrase no no sacred cows like there is nothing um that you know a particular organization does that cannot or should not ever be challenged. Like if there's a, an idea or a, a reason why maybe we should consider changing something, doing something differently, like we should always consider that, uh, you know, maybe the decision is made to stay the course doing whatever it is that one is already doing. And that's absolutely fine, but at least have the conversation, yeah. you know, to your point earlier, make that person feel like they are being heard and their opinion is considered, even if, the decision is made to continue in a particular trajectory. Yeah, but this is more about the communication part again. Yeah, yeah. agreed. Okay, anything else on either of these three points? Uh, no, I think we did those justice. Justice, <laughs> justice delicious. All right, 
Um, so we'll move from from three points to seven signs. Uh, this is obviously a, a, a discussion of numbers, uh, but the the thing I, I like at the, the top of this article, well, I don't like it, it's a terrible thing to, to be saying, but I think is very true. Um, there used to be an old saying, people don't leave jobs, they leave managers. Um, which I still think is there's, there's a strong element of, of truth to that. Um, but this, uh, this comment from Dr. Dr. Uh, Amina Itislimi, maybe, um, people don't leave jobs, they leave toxic work cultures. It's the same thing, um, right? I mean, if you if you take a, yeah. as true that managers are it's the most responsible of the culture in a the company, mm. then it's pretty much the same thing. But a, one bad manager probably won't influence a culture in a 10,000 people organization. But if it's a top manager, he'll attract similar kind of people. And that's when the rot starts spreading, I guess. Yep, indeed. So... This is, you know, quite a quite a good uh, quite a good article, um, and it it calls out kind of seven things to sort of look out for. Um, I don't need, know that we need to spend a huge amount of time on on every single one of them, yeah. but the first one we kind of did already. Know, poor leadership, and yeah. Management. Poor leadership and management we've sort of covered already. Like, I think trust is a trust a pretty important one. This talks about trust being limited, and again. I mean, this is also one of those, uh, it's not just about the, the managers, it's about sort of you trusting your peers, you trusting the decisions that are being made, you trusting, you know, all those kind of things. Yeah, I do think the, the article is not uh, wording it correctly because it says here, uh, in a toxic environment, trust is perceived as something that needs to be earned rather than provided. I think trust always needs to be earned. For me, the difference is when you start, you should not have to start proving yourself. You should start on a basis where, okay, we hired you, we think you were a good candidate, so we trust you. And it's up mm -hmm. to you now to retain that trust. And if you do stupid things, you will lose that trust and you'll have to earn it back at that point. We're not just going to give that back to you. So I do yep. think that trust needs to be earned, but the starting point should not be negative. It should be slightly positive, let's call it that. Yeah. Yeah, or at the very least neutral. I think a bit upper than neutral because you decided to hire this person because he, was, yeah, he, and yeah. he or yeah. she was better than the other candidates. So this person is bringing something. So it should be slightly positive. But it shouldn't yeah. hire somebody and everything this guy says is what we're going to do now because he knows better than us. In that case, you have bigger problems. <laughs> well, unless that's why you've hired that person. Yeah, if you if you if you bring in a new leader to lead something, then um, yeah. But I mean, let's 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 drill down on that one. You have this concept of the change management manager who who you bring in to redo the organization, and now we'll swivel from a lost leader to a shining example. It never works. Sure, no, they have a role that. and they have a position, but they need to be followed by the next step. Because a change manager is kind of there, in my opinion, to get rid of the "quote unquote" refuse, garbage, garbage uh, the, 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 the the things you want to get rid of. So you have a fresh tilled garden to start building your plantation up again. So I suppose I was less talking about that and more talking about let's say there's something that you don't do as an organization today, and you bring in someone to start doing that thing. He should be starting to do that thing under the leadership of the rest of the company. Or else you will have a totally split brain situation when right hand doesn't know what left hand does. But anyway, but that you're literally hiring them to do this new thing. And they have hundreds of years of experience doing this thing, whatever that thing is, because they're a robot yeah. that has lived for a hundred years. Then you surely you listen to them. Surely for you, that you, thing, but not for the rest. Yeah. That's what I mean. <laughs> okay, we're in violent agreement. <laughs> moving on. <laughs> um, Never happened before. <laughs> so, uh, next point. Next point. I think is reasonably obvious, but let's give it uh, give it its thirty seconds of airtime anyway. Um, workplace morale is at an all time low. I, I would absolutely say that if this is the case, then uh, yeah, you probably need to be looking elsewhere. 
hey, depression has its use. I mean, without it, all of these psychiatrists would ha not have a job. Oh, dear. Just finding the silver like, lining. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, but this is important if, here. It can rub it up on, other, on others. Yeah. And th that's the thing. Like, if, if it's just con constrained within one part of the team or one part of the organization, like, it does spread. Yeah. It's not, it's not something you can, you can just isolate. Oh, well, you know, we've got one terrible manager who's doing terrible things to their team over there, but we're doing all right, Jack. Like, that's not, it's not something that uh, that usually uh, can can sort of uh, continue for very long. Yeah, related to that, what often happens when a manager isn't performing up to spec, they get kind of positioned somewhere where can they do the least harm. That's not oh, a good God. solution. It still yeah. spreads across the whole thing. Yeah. And the fourth one: employees have a pervasive fear of failure. Yeah, that for me is the most important one of the list here. And that's the one I was alluding to earlier when we were talking about the agility yeah. of the company. A bad, a, a toxic environment will cause people to be more cautious, take less risks, because when I open my mouth, I get shut down anyway. And that's a big problem for any kind of company that's doing anything innovative. I guess if you're just filling racks with produce, Mm. Not that much creativity is required there. So there are exceptions, of course, but still in those cases, it's not a good thing. If people are in fear, I'm thinking about the big warehouse fulfillment centers. You can think of the companies yourself. <laughs> um, but yeah, having that kind of, I, I know at the company that I work and I'm pretty sure the company where you work, if that culture would exist, we would no longer be in business. No, definitely not. And it's it sort of the, the, the point on this comment is that it's about uh, people feeling that their mistakes will be held against them, mm -hmm. that, you know, people will ev forever be referring to that time they got that thing wrong <laughs> and not in a like humorous joking way, but in a it's this is continually referred to kind of uh, negatively about your performance or you mm -hmm. know, whatever it might be rather than, OK, you know, this this happened. That was a bit of a train wreck. What do we learn from it? Ah. What can we do to make sure that we, you know, we don't do that again? And, you know, how can we make sure that others also learn from it? Yeah, and that's the important thing, right? The learning from it. I mean, if I make yeah. a mistake, that's uh, that's good, but that's good. But if I make the same mistake twice, that's not good anymore. And luckily, recently in the last uh, five years or so, I guess, there's been this uh, growth mindset movement coming up where people are actually encouraged to take risks where it is of, at the onset set. It's fine if you try something and it fails, as long as you learn from it and do the iterative approach and we try again and we use what we learn and do it again. And those that growth mindset idea, that's very indicative of a good company culture. As long as it passes that first, uh, the first point from the previous article, uh, not the do as I say and don't do as I do, it needs to be top to bottom, left to right. Everybody needs to embrace that concept or else it won't work. Yep. Indeed, indeed. So the fifth one, uh, excessive absenteeism and high turnover. Yeah, um, obvious results of uh, course. Yeah, always, always strong indicators of uh, bad things going down. And, uh, you know, Jan, Jan and myself uh, worked in a, a big data company for uh, some time. And one of the big data projects uh, that I certainly uh, saw some data from was they were looking at uh, security access data and looking at um, when employees were logging into and, you know, timing out of systems. And this was back, uh, obviously, significantly pre-COVID when people were, you know, going to offices and when they would clock in and when they would clock out. They would also have uh, data sources from their uh, HR systems of when people booked holiday, when people took time off sick. And uh, this particular organization could predict with about 
high 90s sort of percent certainty when someone was going to resign from the organization just pretty much just using that data that's even without using any form of performance management data from from sort of the people operations or hr teams or anything like that and that was and it all makes sense like all of those signals are things that if you think of people that you've known before that are you know checked out or you know, decided this is no longer where they want to be those are all things that you can imagine you know would uh, would get to it but sort of i was still you know pretty impressed with the level of accuracy that 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 system had to be able to predict what was uh, what people were thinking there. Yeah, for me, it's actually a standard question when I do a hire interview. If I'm looking for a new job and I go in for an interview, they always have a point, should have a point where they ask the person that wants the job, do you have any questions? I mean, what I want to ask is, what's the company culture? The answer you'll mm. get is, great, doesn't work. But what I ask instead <laughs> is, Oh, the team I'm going to be in, what's the turnover and people have been? How long was the retention rate? Things like that. Because that's something people talk, usually talk a bit more freely about. And it's a very high indicator of the corporate company culture because if there's been a lot of turnaround and there's no explanation for it. Because sometimes uh, we used to have things Windows, no switch to Linux. Yeah, there'll be some turnaround there because some people don't want to switch uh, their technical knowledge and things happen. But if there's no, no solution, no uh, explanation for the high turnover, mm. That's a big red flag. And typically, in these interviews, I usually get a decent answer from it. I also always ask to just walk around the floor for half a day or a half an hour, even just be able to look around and see if everybody is sitting there not talking to each other, which typically means that they don't know each other well enough, so they're new, there's a lot of new people there. Or if it's just one big, yeah bizarre going on there and people everybody knows so from years on and it gives you a good feeling of it yep indeed indeed all right so we're running a little long so we'll see if we can pick up the pace a little bit um <laughs> that's right in these start to get like very 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 toxic like bullying and gossip is tolerated uh, happens more than you would imagine. I mean, this doesn't have no, to be the does. out and out, uh, I'm hitting somebody in the face. This is the more of the insidious little things, right? Continuously remarking something about somebody without anybody yeah. saying, hey, hang on. And this can go from uh, slight racism, misogynism, things like that. And again, a good company culture and that diversity thing. We haven't used the word yet in this episode, so we need to put it in right. once. Because yeah. again, that's why you have want to have that diversity to make sure that any kind of latent bullying and gossip, uh, typically bullying, yeah. is at least remarked upon. Because if it's not being remarked yeah. upon, it just happens and it becomes normal at a certain point. Indeed, indeed. And then the, the seventh one here, office, polit office politics start to emerge. I'm trying to put my teeth back in. Um, <laughs> this is another sort of area where it talks about, you know, preferential treatment or favoritism or nepotism or like any of these negative isms that are happening um, can all be very you know, very strong signs of a, uh, a toxic culture and something to really, really watch out for. Um, difficult to detect from the outside, I think. So I, you, you might be able to pick up on some of it if you get a chance to, you know, chat to peers within a team maybe, but relatively difficult to, to pick up from sort of uh, just a, a quick interview set of interview chats, I would think. Uh, yeah, hard to pick up too. This is also related to the uh, Holy Cow projects that you were talking about earlier, which the untouchable things you didn't talk about. Yeah, uh, I do think, however, that the article is a bit idealistic because I think it's impossible to avoid office politics altogether. There's always some going on. So the starts to emerge, no. Starts to become a problem is where I would say because there's Politics is another word for interaction. Yeah. You're not going to avoid that. There's always going to be the goods and the bads and the idea of preferential treatment. Preferential treatment is actually good. If you're a good employee, you have good ideas, you have 
good work, you, you do a lot, you put effort in, you should get some kind of preferential treatment. I mean, if you do a lot of work uh -huh. and I just sit mm -hmm. around and, and nod all the time, if a decision needs to be made, your voice should be heard louder than my voice. That's that's why I, you do the effort. I don't think that I don't think that actually is preferential treatment though. That that is I'm valuing you higher than me, so I'm preferring you. It it's uh, I, letter versus I think it's I think it's semantics. Yeah. <laughs> and as we always know, Jon is always up to semantics. And I think we we've probably run a little bit long and despite us saying this was going to be the last episode Nope. <laughs> I think we might have one more in us, <laughs> and which is good because this one has ended up on a little bit of a down note. But uh, I think you should all stay tuned uh, for our hopefully, maybe fourth and final episode <laughs> on workplace culture, where we're going to talk about creating the best workplace on earth, and we're also going to talk a little bit about. Um, what Google learnt on its quest to create the perfect team. Now, before before you immediately switch off and go, ugh, more Google stuff. Um, this is uh, this is actually a surprisingly interesting um, sort of experiment that Google ran. This is not about the the typical Google culture that you've probably heard more about. You know their somewhat interesting interview process and all the stuff like that. This is a very different view into uh, teamwork and how it works. So hopefully you'll uh, you'll tune in for, for our fourth and maybe final episode on that. And with that teaser out of the way, this is all the time we have for today. You can support this podcast. You can become a patron. All contributions help, and the different tiers actually give you nice things to make us do work for you. So have a look if you haven't before. We are on YouTube. If you look at watch it on YouTube, you can actually see me underneath Dave. I need to switch up the layout from time to time. You can like, subscribe, hit notification bells, all the YouTube stuff. Dave is happy. You can also go to www.roaringalpha.org. There's links there to the Patreon page and all the information on the podcast. You can follow me on Twitter from time to time using the at Roaring Elephant tag. And you can send your feedback by plain old mail to podcast at roaringelephant.org. Until next time, my name is something with antics, Jon. <laughs> Damn it, I was going to say and my name is Semantics Dave. <laughs> oh, oh, there we go. Well, even on that disappointment, we still look forward to talking to you all next week. Goodbye. See you then.